the faculty of language seems to be unique to human. They have what we call natural language. Now, natural language is characterized by certain features. Some of the people call them even design features. It includes things like compositionality. I mean, you can convey meaning by the different combination of words. Uh, there is uh, something which is called symbolic reference. This is important also. It means that there is you know, no obvious coupling between a particular form of a word and its meaning. And, for example, uh, in English, if I say tree, that's tree in English, but it's fa in Hungarian. So that kind of symbolic um, nature is a part of language, and most of our words are actually symbolic, except for ones who imitate certain bird songs and these kinds of uh, words. Um, there is also something uh, which um, is very important that um, syntax or other people would say grammar um, and grammar uh, the, the engine whereby you can construct sentences of all kinds um, has a very important component which is called recursion now recursion means that for example if you divide a sentence into, let us say, a, a word phrase and a noun phrase, then within the word phrase you can have another word phrase and then in that another noun phrase and so on. I mean, of course it cannot become infinitely large because uh, people are not going to have uh, enough memory to just hold in, in, in uh, that in their head. But nevertheless, the, the, the syntactical structures that we are using on the fly as it were, are very, very complicated indeed. Now, if you look at animals, animals can communicate, uh, it depends on the species, of course, what communication system they are using. In many cases, it's not symbolic at all. For example, if you consider the B language, in the case of the B language, um, uh, they are communicating about, uh, for example, the distance and the direction of the food, but it's something like iconic uh, communication and it's about a very restricted set of things. Um, we seem to be communicating about uh, anything, basically. Now, the linguistically trained apes, as they are called, um, uh, have also some modest um, things to show us. Um, they can indeed learn a few hundred words, uh, but uh, there is really not much sign for uh, syntax, there is some compositionality that they can um, bring words together, but uh, there is nothing like, for example, a sentence structure. Now with this kind of communication you cannot communicate too much, you cannot communicate about things that you can imagine or that happened in the past, you cannot negotiate how to divide up labor and so on all these advantages that we uh, seem to have. So there is undoubtedly a gap, a gap between um, animals and humans and this regard, and this gap is not alone. Imitation seems to be something which, for example, apes are also not very good at, contrary to common wisdom. Uh, they hardly ever teach their kids. Uh, surprisingly. Teaching is different from learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they learn a lot, but yes. teaching is an explicit uh, action in order to teach you something so that you learn it, and it involves feedback, you know, several times, several rounds of feedback, and that doesn't seem to be very widespread either. So it seems that you have this suit of um, yes. different capacities that we believe uh, uh, in the evolutionary lineage leading to humans must have co-evolved. The question how? How is that possible? Some people have called the origin of language the hardest problem in science. Now, of course, you can always argue about such a statement, uh, but perhaps it's fair to say that it's one of the hardest problems in science uh, because of the following complication. Um, when you 
learn a language, for example, your mother tongue, for example, you, you learn it from your neighborhood and then you can pass it on. And already at that stage there is, of course, some change in the structure. Um, then as the learners are learning from each other and passing them on, that's the cultural production of language. Language is culturally transmitted. But if you think about the process of the origin of language, if language had any use at all, and I think it would be very balmy to argue that it didn't, so if language had any use at all, then a change in the usage of language must have fed back on the biological processes because it redefined the environment. Yes. And how the environment, what the environment looks like defines something which evolution biologists call the fitness. Yes. The fitness is basically, uh, to cut it short, uh, the expected number of offspring. And that depends in what environment you are, and in such an environment, uh, mo uh, a very important part of the environment is the other individuals in the group. And if they use language or they use a changed language, then they are redefining your environment and possibly also your fitness, which then selects for, for example, for learning rules uh, uh, in the in the nervous system, which enables you to master language more efficiently. So there are these three processes uh, that are somehow interwoven and therefore it seems difficult where to start an investigation so that we ultimately can account for the origin of the language faculty. You could say that because there must be some genetic background to it, but, but unfortunately we don't know what it is, um, there must be some genetic background between the difference, uh, uh, I mean, behind the difference uh, between apes and humans in this regard, then uh, you can say that something is innate, um, and then uh, you can say, well, it's uh, the brain that we are using in order to learn language yes. and therefore the brain must have somehow changed so you could say from the biological point of view the origin of language in a way is um, a problem in the evolutionary development of biology of the brain how evolution and modified genes that instruct a modified brain which is more proficient in for example uh, the calculations that you need for symbolic reference or syntactic recursion or whatever.